My name is Elaine Chang, and I'm a board member of Charlottesville Women in Tech, or as we call it, CWIT. CWIT's a local organization which creates a community for women and girls interested in or are practicing a career in technology. And our mission is to build relationships, create a network, and provide resources and education to those women and girls. Hopefully, eventually, to close the gender gap in technology. And on behalf of the Charlottesville Women in Tech organization, I would love to welcome you today to the Women in Tech 2020 Summit, Create a New Story. No doubt we all feel that the world has become complex and that so many things in our life right now are on hold or maybe unknown. Yet we believe that this is the time to take advantage of that complexity and unknowns and to set a new direction for yourself. That's why we create this, created this summit and have titled it A New Story. We have curated three days of content that we hope will help aid you in your and inspire you in your decisions to create a new story. We have three days of summit content focused on with each day having its own theme focused on that journey. Day one is focused on growing and building your tech career, and that's today. We're honored to co-host today's event with UVA Darden's Batten Institute, an organization which itself is focused on transformative learning experiences and focusing on building more entrepreneurship in our communities. We want to thank the Batten Institute for their support of CWIT both today and beyond this conference. I'm pleased to kick off our summit with our day one keynote, Unleash Your Own Story, One Ask at a Time. This keynote is meant to inspire you to take that next move in your story. And we're extremely lucky to have two phenomenal keynote speakers with us today. I will briefly introduce both speakers and then turn the stage over to them. Our first speaker is Dr. Lalin Anik. Lalin is an assistant professor of marketing at University of Virginia's Darden School of Business. As an expert in the science of behavioral change, she combines insights from psychology and economics to tackle big business and societal problems. Professor Anik has worked closely and consulted with major companies, organizations, and governments to design novel social interventions that help consumers, employees, and communities make better decisions and lead healthy, happier, and more productive lives. As an award-winning teacher, Professor Anik was named as 2019 MBA Professor of the Year from Poets and Quants, which is a huge honor. And she holds a doctorate of business administration from Mar and a business administration degree in marketing from Harvard and a BA degree in psychology and business from Brandeis University. I'm thrilled to introduce her co-presenter, Professor Roshni Ravindaran who is an assistant professor of business administration and leadership and organizational behavior at UVA Darden as well. She received her PhD in business administration from the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California. Professor Ravindaran's research focuses on understanding the future of work. In particular, she examines how technological advancements influence organizational actors, workplace practices, and the management of employees. Roshni's research has been published in academic journals such as Computers and Human Behavior, Behavioral Science and Policy, and outlets such as MIT Sloan Management Review. It's also been featured in the Financial Times, Business Insider, Marie Claire, Forbes India, I think I could go on and on, and she's received numerous international awards. Thank you, Roshni and Lalin, for being with us today. I will now pass it over to you. I think you're still muted. Yeah. Start again. So thank you so much, Elaine, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for sparing your time and like being with us today for half an hour, an hour, uh, to spending your, your morning with us. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to be here with a dear colleague, a brilliant researcher, an amazing person, and a very dear friend of mine. So it's one of those sort of things you do in life, and it's like a dream come true, and, and to talk about sort of how do we unleash our own stories, one ask at a time. Rashi and I are two women 
who teach at a business school, who are at the core of the industry. Uh, at the same time, sort of, we have struggled through the things we're going to talk about personally, and we have spent a lot of time thinking about them. We have researched some of the ideas, and uh, we're going to uh, share with you. And today is about unleashing your story, and it is about approaching ourselves differently and then negotiating with our own stories, with our own narrative, and the world around us to demand more. Uh, not only for ourselves, but for those around us. And we'll share with you some of our own research, some of our own struggles, and we're hoping to go for about sort of 35 minutes and open it up to questions. I want to give a heads up. Rashi needs to, she's in between two classes right now, so she might need to uh, run off, but we'll try to be here as long as sort of possible and we'll hold the fort and sort of continue, start and continue the uh, conversation. All right, so let's start with, so we want to start out with some of the, questions that as women, women in business, women in this world, in today's world that we ask of, of ourselves. So have you ever asked yourself at least one of the following questions? Am I enough? Am I too much? Am I asking for too much? Am I welcome? Am I qualified? Am I skilled and trained enough? Do I deserve to be here? And fill in the blank, blanks, am I too emotional, sensitive, passive? I'm guessing that all of, almost all of us have asked at least one of these questions. If not with this verbatim, you, uh, we might have asked something similar in our lives. And I think it is important to start out with our feelings and where we are in the world and how we think the world sees us. And if you haven't asked one of these questions and you say, none of these fit me, then we're lucky to have you in our community, to have you with us, to have you in the conversation because we can learn a lot from you. So at the beginning, we wanted to ask you to fill in the menti and, and um, because it is important to start out with sort of how do we perceive that we are perceived in the world, not only our questions, but what are those perceptions? So I want to quickly show those. This is what's this is the world word bubble that's coming out of sort of you. And what we see is sort of society doesn't like women who are powerful, bold, assertive, outspoken, opinionated, confident, right? All of the things, if we, I think if we took that headline, the question, all of the things that we take pride in being, being ourselves, am I too much, right? Asking that question, and these are perceptions of how the world sees us. It is important to start out with our perceptions. And I think what is a bit sad here, or sort of something to think about is that this is not only our perception. There's a lot of data that shows that this is, a, this is similar to how the, the world actually sees us. And, in there, sort of what is striking to, to us is that the, the world um, perceives and how we feel that it is actually costly to be a woman in this world, okay? And that is what might make us feel hesitant about bringing our true selves every day to wherever we go and bringing our true selves to, um, to work. It is costly to be, to be a woman because there's a lot of biases and stereotypes we have to sort of fight against uh, and, and these stereotypes do not only come from men, but they also come from each other, from women. We have stereotypes towards each other. There's a task that is often used, which is called IAT, which is the implicit association task. And in there, what you do is you put a word or a description in the middle, and you put in this example, male or female, and then you ask subjects to, to classify the, 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 the word in the middle as male or female. So what researchers did in this specific task is that they either put hard sciences like chemistry, biology in the middle, or they show liberal arts, uh, history, geography, whatever, uh, anthropology in the middle, and they said quickly um, group these, categorize, categorize this. And what this research showed is that when it is a hard science in the middle, both men and women classify this word quicker as male. And if it is a, a liberal arts category, those are classified more as female as belonging to associating to, uh, with women. And this task is used because it is a very subconscious or implicit way of measuring the associations we have in the world. These are not, if you ask people, they, people might say, I don't have stereotypes explicitly, but implicitly these surface. And it's not only that the stereotypes exist, but they really affect the way that we are, um, we perform in the world and our performances are evaluated. Since Rashni and I are educators, we want to give you an example from sort of we systematically from teaching, which is that we systematically give lower teaching evaluations to women, 
female teachers and professors than men. And this is more true for junior faculty. Rashni and I are junior faculty at Tarden, right? And, and this is even bigger for mathematical courses or courses that are um, um, historically associated with male. And this is mostly run by male students tend to rate uh, female uh, teachers less. And what happens, this is sort of in the short term, we get affected, but what happens in moving into the future is that our confidence lowers, and then we start dedicating our resources into teaching. And we know very well that tenure is driven by both teaching and research. So it takes away it, uh, from one of the categories because we don't have enough time or energy to attend to it. Right? So, it uh, so these stereotypes and biases affect our performance. And not only that, it affects how we come across and how we present ourselves, right? Women who express anger in professional environments, contexts are, are given lower status, they're, uh, they're seen uh, given lower wages, and they're seen as less competent. Uh, while on the other side, a man who's angry is competent and confident and has a higher status. I think one of the things here that really struck, uh, strikes me as important is that it is actually in the society better to be a sad woman than an angry one. Like imagine the, the consequences of that. Sad woman has higher status than an angry one. And finally, if we say, okay, at work, this is like this, but when I go home, things relax. It, it's not like that either. So they did this research in, at actually University of Virginia where they looked at heterosexual couples and they looked at how do men in a heterosexual couple perceive their, uh, their partners in situations where they're both performing certain tasks. And what the research shows is that if a woman and a partner, a sort of female partner performs well in a relationship and in a task that's unrelated to the relationship, the man feels more like a failure and they rate themselves as having less self-esteem. Just imagine this. And even in situations where there's no competition, the man says, I'm a failure, I, sh I should, I'm... It, this is deep down, because when you ask all of these men, they say, I wanna date a strong, nasty woman. Like everybody wants that on the surface, but implicitly there are all these biases. And these type of biases actually really impact the way we approach life and ask things from life. Uh, Roshni, I want to turn it to you. This is your expertise. Why are we so hesitant in the world to ask for more and negotiate for more? Thank you so much. And I'm going to begin by seeing, saying that you're actually watching the brilliance of one of the best people at Darden. So I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, and, you know, the question that you asked, Lillian, is a very, very important one. Let's turn to some examples in the world of negotiations, right? Like these are some things that all of us can very easily relate to. Well, the first thing that I'm gonna show you is some data from studies that have explored systematically whether women and men negotiate job offers. So this is a study of graduating MBA students. And what they found was half of the men in the graduating class negotiated their job offers compared to only one eighth of the women who graduated Graduated. I mean, that's a massive difference if you see there. You know, this is this is very common. This has happened to a lot of us. When we graduate, we're just like grateful to have the job. We think it might be selfish to negotiate for whatever reasons. And we'll unpack some of these reasons in the next uh, few minutes. But just just remember, there's a significant difference between men and women when it even comes to the likelihood of negotiating jobs. And the other example that I'm going to talk about is one of the things that most of us might have experienced. This is in the world of car sales. So when we go into a car dealership, we see all of these things, we've done our research, we know we might be paying a little bit more, we want to negotiate. And yet, just to avoid this pain of asking, this pain of negotiating, we are actually willing to forego about $1,400 compared to men who are only willing to forego about $650. So it's almost like we're willing to forego double the amount just so that we shouldn't ask and just to avoid this pain of negotiating. Now, let's talk about why that might be the case. Well, first of all, we might be thinking, okay, this is probably because, you know, we don't have the skills or the confidence. It's not about any of that. It is about how we think we will be treated when we ask, when we negotiate with ourselves, when we negotiate with the world outside of it. So, 
let's let's look at some research studies that really explain to us what is it that is driving some of these uh, you know intuitions that we have about ourselves well what are some common assumptions that we have when we negotiate well first of all we think okay when we negotiate we might be coming across as aggressive pushy a lot of the words that we saw in the mentee poll actually there is a social cost to negotiating and our intuitions about being perceived as unlikable pushy or aggressive or undesirable people to work with unfortunately those intuitions are actually correct so when you survey others who are seeing us negotiate and self-advocate for things like a higher pay that presents actually a much more difficult situation for us socially compared to men now i'm realizing that i'm leaving you with data that is quite depressing but let's hold on that for just a second because we're not going to leave you like that well one of the other reasons why we feel like it's hard to negotiate is because we believe and correctly so that it is going to be hard for us to balance self-advocating like advocating for what we want asking for what we want and this feeling of communality the sense that oh, okay, we are people who care about the world, who care about others, who like to make sure that everybody is doing okay. And yet, if I ask for something, that's going to be problematic. I'll give you a specific example. I spoke to several women in leadership positions recently, many of whom were working for organizations that were nonprofit organizations. And immediately their thought was, oh, this is already a nonprofit organization. I'm not going to ask for more because this feels like a very selfish thing to do. If asking for more already automatically to you means that you're not communal, that's a problem. That's not the case. We can very effectively balance self-advocacy and communality. And then, of course, this idea of how do we manage difficult emotions? On the Menti poll, we saw, oh, you don't want to come across as like an angry woman or someone who's opinionated or someone who's loud. Those are things that might happen in a negotiation. So how do we manage some of our emotions in these negotiations? So, you know, the big takeaway I'll say is, of course, we have these intuitions that were going to be perceived in these negative ways. And unfortunately, some of those intuitions are correct because that's how the world, because of the various um, systemic problems in our world, is tuned to look at us. But that doesn't mean we can't do anything about it. Of course, we can do something about it. We can absolutely change the narrative and we can absolutely define ourselves differently, define the world differently. We can ask differently. And this is where I'm going to you know, ask you, Lillian, can you tell us what we can do to really start thinking about this differently? So even though the, there are all of these stereotypes in the world around us, we can do something about it. As exactly like you said, uh, Rashni, we can start to define ourselves differently. And um, I, th I thought maybe I could tell you a little bit about my journey and how, how I have struggled with it to give you a little bit of sort of window into, into my struggles. Uh, and then maybe that will be sort of more effective into sort of explaining how or, or giving examples of how we can define ourselves uh, differently. I was born and raised in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, in a very loving home. And when I look back, uh, I now realize that th the way I was treated at home by my parents had little to do with my gender, uh, meaning things would have been pretty similar had I been a boy. Uh, I think the attention, love I received, uh, the opportunities would have been similar, yet uh, the society was really rough on a tomboy who was growing up in the 80s. Um, at that time, it was hard to be a tomboy with short hair, who loved to play soccer, um, who loved to run around with the boys. All these things were not appreciated. And uh, from a young age, I realized that um, these were sort of almost inappropriate. Uh, they were first sort of tolerated for a little bit, but then judged and made fun of. And it wasn't only by my peers, actually. My um, teachers made fun of me, called me names. I was a swimmer. I swam professionally for Turkey and my coaches would call me names. And it was, um, when I think back, quite painful throughout my sort of childhood and teenage years. And I just realized I didn't fit them all at all. And um, in my teenage years, the realities of being a woman kicked in more sort of as a pro swimmer, my body was 
uh, was very much the property uh, of the public. Uh, because as a swimmer, we would get weighed publicly every day and it would be, our weight would be announced. And as a result, our coaches would know our weights and women would be weighed more frequently. And the boys, our teammates would know. And there were a lot of situations in which where we'd be around the dinner table after enduring a camp and the coaches would shout across the room and say, Lenin dropped the fork and passed the dessert to, you know, so-and-so who'd be a sort of male, a, a, a friend of mine on the team because as women, we've gained weight much faster. So my body, I felt, was part of sort of everybody, uh, or everybody's business. For me, coming to the U.S. when I was 18 uh, was a bit of a relief. And I'm not going to say because of the society, but more so in terms of recreating myself and recreating my story and narrative. Uh, because I realized that the narrative I had for 18 years didn't have to be my narrative. And that was my first awakening. The next challenge was when I realized that I was queer, and that was in my 20s, and it took me about 15 years. So I'm 36. So very recently, I started sort of coming to terms with it. And um, it was a lot of exploration, a lot of pondering, and a lot of reflection, but it is adding to, it has been adding to my minority status, and I've been very aware of it. And it was very hard to live multiple lives and to, to hide in a closet, because when you are in a closet, you are not only bringing in whatever the main thing you're hiding, which was my identity, I kept pulling in other details of my life. So a big chunk of my life, it was like, imagine, I'm, I imagine myself in a big closet with everything sort of piling up on me because I was so scared that if I reveal one part of myself, everything else is going to seep out and people are going to judge me. So through that, I lost a lot of friends uh, because nobody wants to be friends with somebody who doesn't say anything about their life and who just asks questions about somebody else. Um, so as a result, I lost a lot of friends and I thought during that time that I was wrong, I was bad, I was less than, I was very shameful. And there came a point in my mid twenties where I could not take it anymore because it was really painful and hurtful to live in that closet. Um, and even I remember when I, my, my partner is on the call uh, right now, that when I came to Darden five years ago, I was not ready to be out. Um, I was not ready to reveal that I had a partner. So I told her, we were living together in Charlottesville. I told her, you can come, but as a friend. And she said, there's absolutely no way I'm going to come as a friend. You have to introduce me as your partner. And it took me about a year at Darden. Not because Darden was judgmental, but I realized that I carried a lot of shame within myself, that I cared, I was very apologetical for who I am. So slowly, what I started doing is experimenting and releasing a little bit with starting with a couple of people around me, then at Darden with a couple of colleagues and with everybody, as I revealed, I realized that the story didn't change. Maybe there were some silences if people felt really uncomfortable. I was lucky that I didn't get bad words or sort of calling names that I did as a child. That said, it could happen. That is the reality of the world today, that hatred and hate language. But then I realized that the more I re reveal, the more I change my own narrative, right? Um, I'm, I find my, my, my own center. I find the people, I construct a world around me that I really care about and everybody else doesn't really matter. I, it really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, I go to bed with my own sort of worries and with my partner and that's it. That's the family, that's, that's the world we live in. Um, so now I see very big similarities with my own students, with the leaders I work with in the field, that I feel like everybody hides a big chunk of themselves because everybody believes that they need to be in a box and anything else that does not fit into that box they need to hide because in case they reveal something that they, they think that everything will crumble and there'll be such judgment. And maybe sitting there, you might have, it might not be your identity, but something else about you. And it might be as simple as you love cooking. Whatever it is, you like to stay up at night. Whatever it is to something really wild, who cares, right? You're hiding. And my invitation to you is sort of start opening that door and releasing a little bit of that. What I found is that, uh, like Walt Whitman says, do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large and I contain multitudes and I will live with that multitudes. So here today, that um, journey is not over for me. If I say I am so comfortable, it's not true in Turkey. I still live a double life and it's a double-edged sword. It's, it's very tough. That said, I've come a long way. And today, like as I stand before you, I feel like I, I am a woman, yes, who teaches at a business school, but who's close with her students 
they're close to my closer to my age but that's okay who shows her em uh, emotions who gets angry and uh, lifts her emotions at her shoulder like sort of sleeves that's okay who might wear a bow tie who might wear a dress and up on a apologetically wear that dress multiple times over the years, who might be feminine or masculine, but these are all within me. These are my multitudes who might play soccer and basketball and carry all these shoes. It might not be a fancy handbag, but I'll carry that as well. These are all symbols for me and who play video games. These are all things and there's so many more. The list can go on. That is there. But I realized that the more I said these and the more I can say these and like me sort of saying these today is also another level for me, sort of, um, it's just, it opens doors and opens doors for me because now I'm constructing myself. And here, my invitation to you is to don't, is not apologize for who you are, right? Um, and most things we do, most things, because there are things we need to apologize for, but for a lot of things, we don't need to. You don't need to apologize if you're connected to Zoom and your microphone doesn't work. I've found that with my students, especially female students, uh, women, they apologize a lot. Just change the language. Right? We don't have to prove anything to anyone at the end. If we're not welcome here, we find a new space and we create that we, if we cannot find a place to belong. And the other thing I want to say is you are not being selfish by doing that, saying, I don't care, I'm going to create my own world. I work with a lot of women entrepreneurs, and this also holds for minorities, that what, what I find is that they, they think that having being a leader and having attention on themselves is very uncomfortable, that they're being selfish. And I tell them, they're, you're not being selfish. You are being unselfish. You're holding space for others to be in that, to, to voice themselves. You're being an example. So my, my, uh, my um, invitation to you is to change and reframe the narrative. You're not being selfish. You're, being, you're giving. You're not being against anybody. You're just being yourself. The other part of this is that you can define your world very differently. If you cannot find a world, and world could be as small as your day, your home, your work environment, right? Or it can be the whole world, however you want to think about it. But you can re we can reimagine our world and our audience. An, ex an example here is this. A few years ago, I gave a TED TEDx talk in Charlottesville, and I was really worried. So before I walked in for days, I imagined who was going to be in the auditorium. I imagined my loved ones, my family, my lover, my friends, close friends sitting there. Yes, they were actually sitting there, but I imagined the rest of the auditorium to be cons uh, consisting of people, full of people that were excited to hear me. And I apply this, uh, this um, technique a lot to many environments, many meetings when I go in. I still have those boxes. I look around and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm young and still not tenure, all these things. But I imagine these are people who are looking forward to hearing what I got to say, who are excited about the ideas. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not, because if I approach with that, I'm going to speak up. And with that, the important thing is to show up. To challenge the stereotypes because if I speak, if I am there, if I show up at Darden as a as a female, young female faculty, whatever it is, that looks different than what a business school professor looks like, right? The change happens. And earlier I talked about the data, which is that there's all these gender stereotypes. And what we what uh, researchers find is that if in a country there are more women who are in science majors, right, that's those stereotypes break down. Uh, those implicit associations start breaking down. Yes, this is part of the system, and it's very hard to change the system when we're not at top. That said, we have to show up so and redefine our world. So that is my invitation to you. We that that I hope that you show up, and that I hope you dare and dare specifically to demand more of the world, to ask questions, to negotiate more. And Rashni, back to you. Can you tell us how can we do that once we define ourselves and define the world? How can we ask for more? Pauline, thank you. And thank you so much for sharing that incredible story. It is so inspiring. And um, I think, you know, it's in like it's amazing to hear that transition. And it's one of the things that I think our audience will hold on to and take with them. Uh, so, yes, as you were saying, the daring to ask, that's the part that I think all of us struggle to do because we don't have the specific tools to think about anything that involves an ask. And specifically, I'm going to, of course, you know, go back to uh, some of the things we can do about negotiating, but we can specifically talk about one, how do we think about negotiating different? When we say negotiations, the world, the sort of media, it's all sort of painted this picture that it's this fixed sum, zero sum game. That's not it. It's not a selfish battle. We're not playing this I win, you lose game. 
what negotiations is this? And I tell my students every day that negotiations is just a problem solving initiative. It is not a fixed trait. It is just something that we can all develop by practicing more and by specifically applying some of the skills that entail good negotiation tactics. One, the skill of building relationships and problem solving. I mean, we're women, we know what this entails. Problem solving, collaborating, relationship building, we're good at all of this. We're good at both problem solving and collaborating. So let's not think about negotiations. Let's just switch the narrative as Lillian was saying, let's switch the narrative about what negotiations are. It is not a zero sum game. It is not a I win, you lose. It's problem solving and collaborating. And we as women are good at both. We just need to understand that and accept that. So once we know how to think about negotiations differently, we can start framing things differently. We can start, you know, preparing differently, we can start asking differently. So let's move on to that next stage, preparation. Preparation is going to be helpful for everybody. Men, women, we all need to prepare for negotiations. One of the key things that we talked about earlier is how we worry about what's gonna happen. But when we prepare and when we specifically and intentionally focus on why somebody might say no and actually prepare multiple counter options, multiple other things, from this problem solving mindset where we know exactly what our target is, where we know what is the lowest possible agreeable outcome for us. Beyond that, staying at the table makes no sense. We should leave. Once we know those things and prepare very, very well, what we can do is we can actually very easily shed this negotiation anxiety. So information is actually going to be your best friend in negotiations. You've got to put in the work, you've got to prepare, because once information is with you, you can really tackle this negotiation anxiety with preparation. So we've talked about thinking about negotiations differently. We've talked about preparing. Now let's really talk about what you need to do specifically when you're at this negotiation table. So the next few slides, you're going to see very specific tactics that I like to teach my students, because once we know some of these tools, think of this as like a toolkit. Once these tools are in that toolkit, you can just go and it's no longer this very difficult thing to do. It's just taking that toolkit and applying it to a particular situation. So after preparing, the first thing you want to think about is how do we raise our expectations? Well, this is a research study that talks about how when both men and women have similar expectation about compensation packages, there's actually no difference in their likelihood to negotiate. So just think about that. Just how we think about negotiations, if we have similar expectations, we are all equally likely to negotiate. So then my question to you is, why should we stop our expectations or lower them even before we get started? There's really absolutely no reason to do that. What is the worst that can happen? Someone can say, no, sorry, I can't give you that, but okay. So what? You've at least tried. You've tried. And not only that, you've actually now added to this toolkit, added one more experience data point to that toolkit. You can now use that to start thinking about, okay, they've said no. What should I do if this happens the next time? But why should we lower our expectations even before we begin? So really, my invitation to you is please raise your expectations when it comes to um, negotiating, because as you can see, expectations matter a lot for the final outcome. So then now we've talked about expectations. We know what to do. So let's actually start thinking about what you do at the table. How do you frame your ask? How do you really start thinking about this idea of balancing self-advocacy, as we talked about before, and communality? This is something that I really, really, really want to hone in because this is one of the things that becomes really difficult for us as women. Now, the short answer is perspective take. There's research studies that talk about how when you explain to your negotiation counterpart, whoever might be on the other side, is it your boss? Is it that car salesperson? Is it somebody else? Is it your partner that you're negotiating with? Is it the world? Whoever it may be. Explain to them why in their eyes it is legitimate for you to be negotiating. Why do you think it's actually appropriate? Why explain to them so that they can understand why your ask matters? And it's important to do that in a way where you can essentially explain and say, look, I understand your needs. I understand what you need. 
And then to say, this is the more assertive self-advocating ask. This is where that comes, that this is the place where that comes in, right? You signal to them, you acknowledge that you understand what they need. And this part we're really, really good at as women we're very good at acknowledging the other person's need. We think about that. We, you know, the previous example I talked about, the nonprofit example, we're very, very tuned into the needs of other people. And yet we don't do the second half, which is this making the assertive self-advocating ask. So really the key here is to frame this ask. And research studies show that when and women, when they perspective take, which is basically thinking personally and then acting in a way that's communal, that's better for everybody, they end up getting better outcomes. They're more likely to reach deals. And this is much more so than we just take the empathetic stance. So we're all really good at empathy. We're good at understanding the other person's needs. We're just not good at thinking about how they might be thinking and thinking about what we can do to assertively then make that self-advocating ask. So really when you're framing that ask, we need to think personally and act communally. So then we talked about preparation. We talked about raising our expectations. Now we talked about framing our ask. So what should we do next? We should really be thinking about how we can make multiple package deals, right? Like this is something that is very, very interesting and something that we might not have thought about. I don't remember ever thinking about this when I right out of college decided to, you know, uh, take a job. I didn't think that I should be negotiating packages. It was not something that's intuitive. Essentially what a package is, is when we think of job offers, there are multiple components to it, right? It's not just your salary. It's not just the monetary part of the job offer. There are things like vacation days. There are things like bonuses. There are things like, you know, um, healthcare plans. There are things like, you know, how many days can I work from home? Can this work for my family setup? There are multiple things that you can negotiate. And once you negotiate packages, what you're doing is you're actually signaling creativity and flexibility. You're not negotiating for this one thing and it doesn't feel like a zero sum game because maybe this company cannot give you something in terms of salary or bonus, but maybe they can give you a lot more vacation days. Maybe they can give you more in terms of um, you know, your, your ability to work from home. I mean, when we take jobs, the most important thing to remember, it's just a job, but you are basically negotiating your whole life, right? You're essentially not just negotiating for that paycheck. You're negotiating for what your life should look like. So let's be more creative and be more flexible when we think about packages. So that's one of the very, very specific things that work very effectively in negotiations and build these packages so that they reflect your creativity and your flexibility. Okay, so we've negotiated packages. What about the next thing? The most crucial thing that stops us and discourages us from negotiating is the no. When you get no, we're just worried that, okay, I've done something, it didn't work, let me shy away from negotiating. We don't do that, right? Why did the no happen? A no, as I said before, could be a no, could be a no maybe, could be a no maybe later, could be no, but maybe there's some other creative option that you're proposing that might be interesting to me that I wanna consider. A no could mean so many things. And unless you ask why, unless you ask why not, you're never going to understand why you got the no. And if you know why or why not, it then gives you a lot of knowledge. As I said before, information here is going to be your best friend. So once you have that knowledge, you're going to then be able to take the why or why not. And then you're going to be able to extrapolate that to say, there are all of these ways in which people can resist my ask. And this is the information that I'm going to use to come up with a good set of responses back to that resistance. So getting resistance, that's not a surprise. That happens to all of us. But how we respond to that, that's where we come in. And then, of course, the key thing is to practice. As I was saying before, what's the worst that can happen? People could say no. That's it. 
okay, now that you have that information, you at least have gotten one more data point with that experience negotiating. So just never ever let an opportunity to negotiate go by. It's not this strange thing. It's a learning experience. It is something that you can build on. And as I said, it's not a fixed trait, it's a skill. So because it's this learning experience, practice is going to really really help you whether you succeed or fail in the process so just focus on the process of doing it and not on the outcomes that we might get as a result so as i kind of you know give you some of these very specific tips one of the things that i would love to highlight and ask lolene here is we talked about defining ourselves differently we talked about defining the world differently we talked about asking and the specific ways in which we can ask lolene can we can we discuss more how we can bring all of this together what should we be taking away from all of this I think, Rashi, thank you. Through this whole experience of prepping for today, I think we got to share a lot of our stories as two women, two colleagues, two friends with each other. And um, so sort of we realized how much our stories are similar. So some of the stories I told you, you were like, yes, I lived that back in India, same with me in Turkey. It's been, it's been incredible. And here, I think our realization from our own struggles and uh, from the research that we've done and we know is that unleashing our stories, that's the theme of today on of the conference of figuring our stories necessitates that we reimagine, reframe our, our own narratives, our own lives, who we are, how we define the world, how we ask the questions, how we approach a negotiation context, how we um, approach that sort of deal, right? And how that, that also necessitates that we reframe and rethink and then ask, ask more, ask and act constantly, consistently, and unwaveringly, because it's not gonna be one time, it's gonna be not gonna be 100 times, it's gonna be probably thousand million times that we have to do this, sometimes the same thing, over and over and over again. That's the part that I think breaks us a lot, but I think we have to reframe it to think that's what makes us stronger, that we're here together, that we're gonna sort of take that chip off the wall, while we're gonna be that water that drips in the same hole. It's not a hit. It's not a, like a tank that breaks the wall. It's the, it's the power, it's the consistency, it's the resilience of the water drop that gets to it. So with that, we want to leave you, Roshni and I would like to leave you with one sort of poem slash quote by Rupi Kaur, who says, sort of asked this question that says, what is the greatest lesson a woman can learn? And she says, sort of that since day one, that we have had everything that we need within ourselves, it's the world, it's the society that convinced us that we didn't. I think it's time that we convince ourselves and we start with the belief that we have all we need to open that hole and make it make a change. It starts with us. And I believe we have it. We, Rashi and I have both felt it in Charlottesville, having both uh, met many of you in, in the community. We have what it takes to make this change. With that, we're out of time. I know Rashi has to go in a very little, but um, we're here to start the conversation and continue. Thank you for, very much for all your attention. Thank you so much, Lalin and Roshni. I hope that you guys, we had a chance to see some of the chat on the side. You, you may not have because you were, you were very focused on, on presenting, but uh, everyone loved what you had to say. And I myself in particular loved the idea about reframing. If we could just reframe uh, so much of the anxiety and the, the not being willing to ask what we, we, we could we could sweep away and be ourselves so hopefully we can take some of those nuggets I really um, loved the the reframing on negotiation We're tucking that one uh, in um, I know you need to leave Roshni thank you so much for for joining us um Lelin, would you like to take a question or two um before sure. I'm here Roshni thank you so much for being here it's amazing as always uh and have a great time in class okay and they're lucky to have you thank you and thank you so much for for having me and this has been a very very inspiring session for me too and Lillian one of my best friends here and to you know hear this again with this audience this morning like so many people in the chat it is so inspiring and thank you Lillian for sharing that and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity and uh, I'm happy to chat uh, post you know the three-day summit please do feel free to reach out my contact information should be available um sorry i have to jump off for class but Lillian will be here uh if you have any questions <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you Rashmi. 
we, we um, if anyone wants to ask a question, um, you can um, uh, hit your button on the top to ask. Um, and while you're doing that, I know we had one question early on uh, in the chat about do um, how should we think about negotiating in this environment, particularly salary negotiation in, in this COVID environment where we know that positions are hard to come by and so we may feel even more pressure perhaps around um, that negotiation. Any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, um, it's tough. It is that fear. It's always there. What would I, what will my life look like if I lose this job or if I don't get it? It's like we always think of those negative sort of losses and losses are very demotivating. We're thinking, oh, what can I lose? How can I sort of fall behind? What is that? Again, reframing that. And rather than thinking about how could this be wrong, asking question like, I am curious about what could be arriving. What could be what could be arriving in my life? What are the opportunities that are coming in? Rather than focusing on one thing and saying, okay, this is the only thing, saying this is one of many, right? Uh, and and then and then approaching it before you go in, again doing your research and writing it down. Like, what are the uh, in statistics, there's confidence in intervals. What are the confidence intervals? What, what is the bottom line the, uh, after which I do not want to sort of give up my life? If I tell this to my students, they go to consulting. I I am pretty against consulting, honestly, because I think it kills lives. And I tell this at a business school, for, for, not kills lives, but it really sort of pushes that back. So going in and saying, what are my expectations? What, do, how, what kind of a life do I want to lead? So I'm going to go with that. And no matter what happens, if I lose this job, something else is going to come. Of course, I mean, this is if you have a little bit of a buffer. If you don't have a buffer, then saying, OK, you know what? I'm going to lower my standards, but here's the time frame. OK, six months, by New Year, by March, if I don't get to what I want, then I'm quitting. I tell my students every year they graduate, I say make a one-year plan. What kind of a person do you want to be? What kind of a life do you want to lead? And if you're not there by then, it's time to consider no matter how well the job is paying, I don't think it's worth it. I live with a bit of an idealism in life, but just pushing for it and really demanding that. I mean, like, okay, this, if this is not it. If I lose, honestly, knock on wood, if I lose my job tomorrow, I'll figure something else out. As long as I'm happy and healthy, I look at it a bit like that at the bottom. There's always a solution. I just don't believe in giving up your ethics, morality, selling yourself for money, uh, being somebody's sort of pop, whatever it is, like I just don't, I don't believe it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice. Um, and it, it is a challenging environment, but I don't think that makes us necessarily change our tactics. So. I um, really love that. Okay, we're going to take one more question. I, I saw okay. uh, this individual try to pop on, but we we, we may have missed you, uh, but they asked it in the chat. Um, how do you explain the pain of approaching negotiation conflict to male counterparts who may not understand the, the concept? Oh, um, what is should you? That's one thing. I think like part of it is how do you deal with the pain and it's like releasing it and it's making something very cognitive rather than painful. That said, this is a question. My answer is I don't know, but what I would try is what pains men? I think what I would approach that men, I think, and this is very big stereotype. Okay, there's so many, like it's so many things, but I think being rejected is something that is very universal. Uh, not winning or feeling like a loser is another thing. So if I have a male colleague and they don't understand this pain of negotiating, I might come up with situations that matter to them. If they love soccer and they hate losing, I might say, what happened in that situation? Like, how did you feel? Or you tried to, your job, you applied for it and you didn't get it. How did you feel and what was it? I mean, I know a lot of male leaders who, who lose their jobs, right? So when they lose their jobs, they feel very dejected in especially men in the midlife in their 40s and 50s it seemed to those leaders seem to have a very tough time i think as women we're a bit more resilient in those times sort of giving that when they experience it it's easier for them to understand the the the, the um, pains of that so for me i find examples to say okay how does this work think of that and i actually bring them down from not here to here to their stomach get them to talk about those emotions if possible how did that feel what was happening that day make it very specific get them to imagine it and then i say and then i say this is exactly how i feel so i i would say i mean rashni is the ex expert in the negotiation part but beyond that sort of using tactics to get them to 
get into the space of empathy, I think might help. That, that's a great answer, uh, honestly. Uh, so thank you for, for that. Okay, we're gonna wrap it up here. I'm sure there are many other questions. I'm sorry, we, we can't get to all of them. Um, as a quick reminder, we, we have recorded this session and we will make it available after. So if you, you need to uh, wanna see it again or, or come back to it, we, we will have it for, for all of our attendees. And with that, I just, I wanna say thank you so much to Lelin for, for joining us. Thank you so much for taking your time. Um, and I know I can tell from the chat, everyone really enjoyed it and we felt very lucky to, to hear your story. So thank you for that. Okay.